cool uh, stuff. It's also something we, uh, and especially Pauline sitting here, is focusing on a lot. And this year it's uh, hot and cool play. Um, I'll put it right with the subtitle, an exploration of play as driver for creativity, innovation and curiosity. I think that is a very compact way to express this session. Thank you very much uh, the, for all the guests coming from everywhere and all over the world. Um, Warren is uh, the founding uh, father of Children's um, uh, Technology Review and he also covered uh, for the New York Times uh, Children and uh, Technology Media. As, uh, special. I hope you, uh, you will enjoy us to, uh, together with us. We're really proud to have you all here. Have a very, very well uh, last minute moment of this day to dig it all in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. It's a won wonderful to be back. I think this is my third year uh, coming to see Nick Kid, and we were just over in the Media Lab, which is uh, such a refreshing place for us all to be. It reminds us why we're here. And you watch the hands, you watch the faces, and that's what it's all about. And so we're ready to continue the play. Um, we have, we're going to, and you're going to get some fresh breaking news today um, from some real experts. Uh, so let me introduce the panel, and then we're going to, we're going to begin. Um, we have from Tokoboka, Sweden, and I believe that Willow, you're going to go first. Um, the play designer for Toka Town. If you haven't played that yet, it's over in the media lab, and we were just playing with it. And so, from Sweden and also from England, um, and we're really excited to hear what you're going to tell us today. I promised you, I think, some breaking news, and that would be cool. And then um, Adrian de Young is going to uh, get you up and moving around. And this will be very interesting. We Did everyone sign a legal waiver <laughs> before you came in? Um, Adrian uh, has some very exciting apps in, in iTunes, some of the featured apps. And one of them is made with the Dutch National Ballet. And so he was actually dancing with my wife yesterday, which is a which is very cool, and um, <laughs> jealousy somewhere. It, you know, the Dutch guys, you gotta watch. Uh, and my wife, by the way, is right over there. Uh, and so, but what it is, is two, two people hold the iPhone at the same time, get it balanced, and they have to coordinate their moves. And so if that's not the most clever way to meet females I've ever met, <laughs> good job, my friend. So Adrian's gonna teach us some, uh, show us some stuff, and then we're going to, uh, Bethany, who's uh, the CEO of Technology Will Save Us. My God, I hope it does. It's not going anywhere. And she has the Arduino and um, the whole maker movement, which is going on. You're obviously seeing it in Media Lab, but it's one of the trends. And so that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna start out with some opening thoughts so I can earn my Heineken properly. And then we'll move into you guys. The Heineken. I, you know, I, I think it's exciting. So these are the guys who are all here. These are the visual effects. This is the best I can do. But it is, we are all hot. <laughs> all right, so here is the worst slide in terms of layout. I apologize. But this is the one slide that you're, all, you're going to want to see. And so I'll run through it very quickly, and you guys can pitch in and agree if, or disagree or whatever, because um, the one, the, this is um, from 2004, I get my hot, the um, Star Wars. Star Wars, uh, yesterday, the, uh, the iPad mini dropped $50 to 250 US dollars. And that's very important because it's $100 more than the uh, Amazon uh, Kids Fire HD, which is a Kindle disguised as a kid's machine. And it's great to see these two giants going at each other. We have a horse race. And we hope that 
somebody will give Apple some decent competition. However, the Apple, in terms of apps, is way ahead and, uh, for 2014. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I guess in the end, Google is catching up a lot as well. Um, but, I mean, Apple is still the place where people pay for their apps. <coughs> yeah, and monetizing the content. And um, so, so that's one headline, and we'll talk about that. The other one is Minecraft it is worth two, $2.5 billion US dollars. Oh boy. So four years ago, Minecraft was just an idea. It was a hobby. And it's now a major deal. So I want to talk about that and the specific magic behind it, why Minecraft is so hot. So I'm going to cover that. And also, I, I think that the overall quality of stuff that we're seeing is more. It's greater than last year. And there's a maturation in the market. As more people, more smart people figure out have a good idea, they get it out uh, for children. Um, the iTunes uh, model of publishing has been healthy for innovation. Um, and there's also a lot of mediocre products, a lot more mediocre products. There are 60, 675,000 apps that will run on the new iPad Air that was announced yesterday. And about 20% of those are for children. There's a lot of digital content. As a matter of fact, we've never lived at another time in history today when there's been so much digital, so many digital options for a young child. So the child born today, all those children in Media Lab have more digital options than any other generation. Lucky for them. Um, also, we can't forget consumer electronics, which drives so many things. You saw many big screens, 55 inches and bigger over there, that cost less than $500. And everybody has them and are increasingly connecting them either to a device that connects them to their tablet or a game console. And they're doing more interesting things. You saw all three game consoles now have cameras that are smart. So body, body computing is becoming into the living room more and then this was a big deal four years ago it's becoming everyone's like kids are like yeah so i'm waving and it sees me so we're getting used to that um, maker mania is sweeping the u.s and i think the uk you would agree and what i would argue is that some of the maker movements are forgetting the piaget and the real the real core of the maker idea which is constructivism and constructivist theory and that is the child is an active learner so, I was at a conference in San Francisco recently, and the maker movement was as broad as cake decorating. Right. And that was a little disconcerting. Right. Um, it was okay, but when I was decorating a cupcake at the break, I was a little bit like, is this really this? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, so, and then also uh, going global, that right now there are, um, you know, we, when we think about developing countries, we think about food, we think about housing it's time to start thinking about apps because we have affordable devices that we can now get to every child and we have to start thinking cross-culturally and across international boundaries because um, it's a it's power it's about power it's about individual empowerment and the change that can make and then finally i'm starting to see and i don't know if you guys are as well but this cultural assimilation of digital media for children, that parents are less concerned, I mean, not always, but in the general media, there was just a, a, um, a very conservative um, southwestern town in the U.S. ran a, store, a headline that said, um, the conversation about video games is changing. And what I'm hoping to see is that we're getting to um, more of the, this is the panel last year, and so I'm asking myself, what's changed since 365 days ago? And one of them is this changing conversation that we're moving the debate from generally screens and we're moving to apps. And what are the specific activities the child is doing? And I think that's healthy. So it's slow, but it's happening. And now I might need some help. I am here. OK. That is captured by the schmaltziest movie I could possibly make in about two hours, uh, made with iMovie by a complete amateur. So I found some, some very, <coughs> supposed to make you kind of moody, because I wanted to make a point. And all I was missing was a good narrator. 
unfortunately. Oops. What is a screen? <laughs> How do screens affect children? <laughs> Can a screen influence an adult child interaction or a scientific idea or provide a social opportunity that never could have existed? As we change into a future full of screens, we must do so thoughtfully. Opening our minds to the question, what is a screen without fear? <laughs> they deserve it. In for our narrative. <laughs> I have to admit, I've never heard that level of narration brought to this production. Um, this was made for the American Academy of Pediatrics, this movie, specifically to get them to think about, you can't just say no screens before age two, that, which is, I would argue, misleading. And that a screen can be something you stand on, something you paint, something that and we have to broaden our thinking. And so, as you recognized, a lot of that footage was because of Pauline and the, and the wonderful stuff over at Media Lab, which I found to be so inspirational in expanding the idea of what is a screen. So yesterday, some news was made. The iPad 2 was born. It seems like every time I come to see a kid, Apple comes out with something exciting, and it's worth exploring. But what I'm starting to see, the press was, the uh, headline was, Apple introduces the iPad Air 2, <coughs> the thinnest, most powerful iPad ever. So I thought it'd be fun to look back at what they said about the iPad Air <laughs> one year ago. Actually, the iPad 2 is the all-new design. It's thinner, lighter, and faster. That was an 11. And then um, the iPad Air, which was one year ago, Apple announces iPad Air dramatically thinner, <laughs> lighter, and more powerful. <laughs> I feel sorry for the Apple PR people. I, I wonder what the iPad Air 3 is going to be. Might it be thinner? <laughs> Maybe lighter? Maybe faster? So, um, because it is news and I think it is hot, it is the, the major device. I thought we should look at it a little bit. That um, It does have a barometer built into it, which I thought was cool. Very cool. Yeah, so it, it can tell you what level you're at. Uh, I don't know what I'll tell you, but... At the end of the day, the difference, the, what's getting thinner is the differences between generations. And the point is that we now have the tools to reach every child everywhere. Moore's Law is doing its work. And it's time to start thinking about how we reach every child. The other news of, I mentioned is the Amazon Fire and also the, all the Android options. And so even the lowest quality Android tablet is better than the most powerful supercomputer 10 years ago. And so there are multi-touch screens, they get internet, Wi-Fi, so it's really exciting. Um, I, this is the Air, this is the one I personally use, and it has the cushion, and this is now $250, so that's good. I wanted to talk about what's cool. Now my definition of cool is, um, things that don't work so well and it's a conversation no one wants to have but I, I have no I'm a critic that's what I do this is hex bugs and my question here is who's the maker here who's the actual maker this this should actually makes kids into the assembler so we have to ask ourselves what is the child actually thinking about and doing what are their hands doing if they're just following instructions when I try this with children it looks very cool but at the end of the day they have to it, it's very low level kinds of things. Please no more flappy anythings, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of those. And so the innovation is, uh, a, a comment? Oh, that's okay. We are interactive. So if I see a hand, we'll take a question. 
And um, so what else? I've seen a lot of apps like this. And if you can figure out this interface, you probably don't need to know how to spell the word tack <laughs> or this interface. Yeah, so <laughs> these are things that I review and there's a lot of, a lot of them and I'm to the point where I just don't even write a review, I don't even start, but there's a lot of them and I think we all need to advocate for quality. Quality in terms of pedagogy, we're seeing the digitization of bad pedagogy. You're taking bad teachers, putting them on really great devices. Can't do that. The word Montessori is thrown around relentlessly in iTunes, 500 hits comes up on the word Montessori, right now on iTunes. And I think Maria Montessori would be screaming in Italian if she saw some of the work. Like flashcards with popping? Please. In 2009, two guys wanted to build a social block building game for kids. One of them was named Notch. The other one was Mark William Hansen. One of them had a lot of money, one of them had a hobby. They assembled their teams. <laughs> office one, office two. <laughs> I have a laser, I use it. Office one, there's office two. They got their best designers together. <laughs> and they said, guys, let's get to work. We're going to make a social block. It's going to, and they were the exact same elements. It's going to have a social element to it. One of them used Unity. The other used Java. One was browser-based. The other download required. Dust maker number one. And one of them <laughs> has turned into gold Minecraft. I think that should be the new name for Minecraft. It's a gold mine. And I think this guy <laughs> didn't know he was making it, but Microsoft just acquired what in four years something what is it about minecraft that makes it hot what do you guys say you can you can make your own world and you can explore someone else's world that's crazy that, that's the the essence of it yeah. would you say that it's not watered down or yes or it doesn't try to rip you off these are things kids actually told me about minecraft they're, they just get tired of games and try to rip, rip them off. There's always after some money or something, even though Minecraft does, will start trying to rip them off if Microsoft bought them, probably. But we'll see. Uh, it's rich in fantasy play. You can interact with real people, and it's edgy. It has real creepers. <laughs> creepers. They call them creepers. And they will try to kill you in the dark. This is great. Um, it's like play patterns. And tag, like... Uh, a game called Manhunt that the kids play in New Jersey, um, building forts, and it's active. <coughs> there are no instructions, no tutorials, no teachers, <coughs> no background music, and it's completely child-driven. That's why I think it's hot. And if you remember those lessons, I think you have a better chance of making hot products versus <coughs> dust products. And this was uh, yesterday, I would, went in there and they were having um, the um, the game where you all sit in a circle. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're, the, what's the movie? Uh, I, I forgot. But they replicated that. And the ultimate sign of defeat is that <coughs> Lego Minecraft is now out. You can actually, Lego just said, forget it. We can't compete. <coughs> We're going to have Lego kits so you can make Minecraft. So there you go. So in conclusion, um, I, I think that we should remember the following. From my point of view, and to frame this panel today, that theory always drives everything that we do with the technology. And theory can be very old, but it helps us understand the new. It helps everything kind of line up, that children 100 years from now will still play the very same way that they play over in Media Lab. And that's the way they did 100 years ago. So that uh, this is the boss that we all work for, and I watched um, Willow's uh, daughter um, hit the home button repeatedly on some of her own apps <laughs> because the child is empowered. And that's the genius, I think, of the iPad is that the child can always hit the home button 
and I hope Apple never takes that right away from every child. And that play is the dog, and technology is always the tail. Play comes first. So I am going to let you um, meet one of the designers for Tokavoka uh, right now, and we're very fortunate to have Willow with us uh, because she is the designer and chief architect for Toka Town, which I, I feel is one of the best apps I've ever reviewed, and I've looked at it, lots of them. And so it's great to have you here. And um, tell us tell us what's coming up next. Now you need to come over here and, mm -hmm. and plug yeah. in. So let's do that. Sorry. And I'll give you the sound. So I can be in complete control. <laughs> yes, and I'll actually give you my chair. So you, oh, you got it. <laughs> Very good. So do I need to speak a wire? new from Tokoboka? Um, I will be showing you a glimpse of something that we're going to be releasing that should be out next week at the end of my presentation, so you'll just have to wait a little bit for that. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how Tokoboka sees play. Um, but first, maybe I should, I don't know if everyone knows about Tokoboka, so I'm just going to say a little bit about them. I'm a play designer there, which means that my responsibilities are coming up with concepts and um, then sort of communicating those concepts to the team and working with a team of developers, artists and project managers to sort of like take that concept and make something real with it. Uh, this is our studio. <laughs> we quite like to play around and build things. Um, it's in Stockholm, and we have 27 people uh, that work in Stockholm, and we do all the apps there, so everything we make that you sort of see and play with is done in Stockholm. But we also have an office in San Francisco, and that has 13 people in it. It's sort of new-ish, and they are responsible for all the marketing, because a lot of our apps are, of course, downloaded in America, so we wanted to be closer to our audience. Uh, we started out in 2011, and we've made 24 apps since then. This is all of them. And we've had something like over 75 million downloads since then. 75 million downloads at 99 cents each. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're more than Hello, that. how are you? <laughs> So it is possible to make money on making apps? It can be done. It can. If, as long as they're hot. <laughs> hot. Yeah, as long as the kids like them. Um, so play. Well, when we're talking about play, it seems to make sense to start with the kid. Uh, and if you think about the kid, their everyday life is usually directed by adults. They're told when to wake up, how to scrub their teeth, what to eat for breakfast, or how to behave at school, usually what to eat for lunch, and also when and how to do their homework. And unfortunately, play is sort of scheduled into their day um, as if it has specific boundaries and time limits. But usually from a kid's perspective, play can happen at any time. It has no boundaries, and it can happen at any point during the day. So this is sort of how we look at play at Tokaboka. We take this approach that it's very everyday. If you look at most traditional sort of ways of playing and games, kids usually sort of like base their play on something that happens in the adult world. So if we look here, you can sort of see that like this is playing doctor and that inspired our app, Doctor. 
I think you can sort of guess. <laughs> so I'm going to go through this. Tea party, talk a tea party, and store, talk a store. Um, and usually with this everyday play, what we try and do at Talk Poker is see how a digital experience can enhance that and improve the play, um, rather than necessarily replace it. But one thing is for certain, we are not the play experts. The kids are the play experts. So we try to bring them into our process as much as possible when we're designing the apps. Um, so we do things like we have workshops with kids when we're coming up with ideas for characters and things like that. We bring them in and we allow them to draw and test things out. We also do a lot of paper prototyping, which is when sort of like a concept is pretty well formed, but you want to like look at more of the details like the flow and things like that. You can make things out of paper and play things uh, and invite kids and play around with them. And then we also do a lot of watching and observing where we don't ask any questions, we try to create very laid back, relaxed environment, and we invite kids into our studios or we go to kindergartens and schools, and we just watch them play with toys, or we watch them play with like prototypes that we've developed, um, and iterate on those things. So, at Toka Boka, we talk about our products rather than games, we talk about them as toys. And if you think about a good toy, it doesn't have any instructions. A kid can just pick it up and play and make it what they will. So we don't have instructions in our apps. Usually what we try and do is provide a setting, characters and tools and allow the kids to make up stories themselves. So that's why you might have noticed in a lot of our apps, there's not really any backstory to any of the characters because we don't want to tell the kids how to play or who they are. We want the kids to add that themselves. And we generally look at sort of like these three types of play at Tokaboka. Um, there's like role playing, of course, when you, when you take on a role yourself or you use characters to tell a story and creative types of play where you sort of design an outcome and then the exploratory type of play where you're testing and building things and seeing what goes on. So I'm going to show you an example of each of these through our apps. Um, Warren mentioned it before, Talker Town. I don't know if any of you have played it. It's our latest app that's out there at the moment. And it's a good example of directed role playing um, because there's not really any any storyline or any sort of like instructions on how you should play. The kids just take characters and have a selection of scenes. Um, and this is Mia, who's age six, playing with Tokotan. This is the bucket house. Oh, she asks for this. And then everybody gives everybody stuff. Has stuff. Okay, well, then, then we just keep on giving her stuff because she's all filled. Like that, and then she just lay down her stuff. See how busy her hand is? There's no limits here. Yeah, you can just sort of move everything into the hand. It's like it's scribbling. It's very empowering. Everyone's hat. Yeah, yeah. It's, a it's a very, it's a big favorite. <laughs> the stacking system was very popular. <laughs> Even the hair. Also, the, the way the sounds support the motion. So she's driving the sound as well. Every detail is child is finger driven. I believe that because there's a round of applause. <laughs> It takes a great amount of discipline to not put things in the apps. Yeah, it's a lot about leaving things out mm -hmm. as opposed to adding things. And you can sometimes get a bit, you can lose control yourself because you're like, oh, this would be so fun. But you have to restrain yourself. Who's fun? And be like, the Who's kid fun? is going to do that themselves. And I would argue that's $75 million. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the secret if you understand that psychology. Yeah, I think if an adult, when you play Talk of Town, you're a bit like, what is this about? You think it's a bit like there's something missing, like it's not quite finished yet. But then when you watch a kid play it, you realize they fill in the gaps a lot themselves. Um, and this is another one of our apps. Uh, it's a good sort of example of creative play. Um, it's hair salon. 
And a lot of the positiveness here is um, sort of like in the interactivity. Like in how you can control the hair and mold the hair and sculpt it in ways that you want to do it. I believe that's Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did they do your hair? Yeah, they made it, they made it darker. <laughs> is emotional reactions. That was really important for kids, for the characters to react when you were cutting their hair. Oh. Usually they react in positive ways, but they can react in negative ways. So you can find kids that are just like, basically sort of torturing the characters, trying to get them to be like, really unhappy. <laughs> never goes back and like shows off the photos. Um, and then I just want to show you, uh, this is Lab, which is sort of an example of exploratory play where the kid plays with, there's like, I think there's 118 elements in the periodic table, but I'm not a scientist. And um, you can sort of like mess around with elements and by like torturing them in different ways, you can turn them into new elements. sort of familiar with this site that's coming in up in supermarkets and toy stores where there's a lot about marketing of separating types of play into girls and boys and then branding that with pink and blue. Um, and we don't, I mean, well, there's nothing wrong with pink and there's nothing wrong with blue and there's nothing wrong with sort of like saying girls prefer this and boys prefer that. Uh, at Tokoboka, we don't understand why you can't just make play available for everyone, why you have to sort of like segment it in these ways. So we, we don't really try to avoid themes, we just try to embrace lots of themes and make them appealing to everyone. Um, and recently, we actually took another look at a very old app that's called Toka Robot Lab, because these values have sort of like become clearer and developed as we've grown. And earlier they maybe weren't so clear and in our process of idea, ideation and development. So we had a look at Tokyo Robot Lab and we realized there was one female robot and she was pink with a heart at her center. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you compare her to the other robots <laughs> that were male, you sort of begin to realize she's quite stereotyped. So um, 
the artist who I work with on my team, uh, she redesigned all the robots to try and be much more appealing to everyone. And you also might notice there's a lot of inspiration here from like everyday objects that come into it, um, rather than sort of like, you know, finding things that might might have some gender message underneath them. Um, and as a final part point, um, this is a photo from our party that we just had. We have um, office parties every year, and we design them for kids. And I was actually a bit shocked this time because supposedly we were having 300 people coming, and I think 150 of those were children. <laughs> So at like five o'clock, our doors are just beaten down by a whole load of kids running through. And uh, what we were doing was, we were basically making our apps real. So this is a scene from mm. Toka Cars, where you could actually get in a cardboard car and drive it around the racetrack. And we sat and spent three days designing cardboard boxes, drawing them so that they looked really nice and like houses, and designing all the cars to look superb. And then in five minutes, this is what has happened. That the kids have come in, they've taken the couple of boxes, they've built a tower as high as the ceiling, and they're just driving into it as fast as possible. <laughs> so it's sort of like a message to be like, you just have to acknowledge that when you're playing, there's a lot of mess. And it's not really about how well everything is spaced and designed. It's just about this fun aspect of sort of like being able to do what you want with it and get as messy as possible. So um, that's me on play, but before I go, I just want to give you a sneak peek of our latest app, and it's called Tokaboo. And I sat down with the play designer who did this, she, her name is Chris, and I just asked her a few questions about it. So I just want to show you this. Yeah, I believe this is breaking news. You're the first to see this. Yeah. Um, I love it. Um, but I'm quite curious as to where the idea came from. One night I wanted to read a new book for my daughter, so I chose this one. Who will comfort Toffel by the Finnish-Swedish author Tove Jansson. And it's about this lonely creature, the Toffel, that leaves his house and goes on a journey. On the way he finds this message in a bottle uh, and suddenly, suddenly he has a purpose. And I think the pictures are so beautiful and full of melancholy and loneliness. And uh, at the end, he meets this scary creature, Moga, the Grok. But he handles her with great courage, and everything ends happily. Harriet got all excited by the book. She had all these new ideas in her head, and new thoughts to process. And that made me think, but how could we create an experience like this uh, as an Abtoka Boga? So what was the next step after that? Yeah, I needed a play pattern for uh, the play experience. And um, preferably something spooky and a bit dangerous. Yeah, I really like app concepts that build on situations or props from the kid's ordinary life. That is really useful as we want to minimize the need of instructions in our apps. How did the idea develop from that point? Yeah, I, tried, I wanted to try out the theme with some kids four or five year olds. So uh, I asked them some questions. Like, is it fun to scare? How do you scare people in the best way? How do you find the best hiding spots? And so on. And I wanted this, this activity to be fun and not like a test. So I brought these props and we cut and, and glued together rooms for the ghost to hide in uh, and acted out scenes. Hidden in here, this one is sleeping in the bed. Ah! <laughs> I had these pre made characters with me with uh, sharp teeth and, and ropes and such, and um, the kids could tell me a lot about them based on those characteristics. The, the artist in the project, Alvid, came up with a more regular family uh, for the ghost to scare, then I thought it made perfect sense. Because what really makes your heart tick is not like these cartoony characters, but um, more the darkness outside your, your bedroom. And, uh, 
bring this boy with night. Previously, you've told me that some of the kids when playing the app get really, really scared, while others find it quite funny. Was that your original idea? Actually, at the end of the project, we ended up over exaggerating everything to make it really crazy fun. The kids tend to think it's hilarious to scare the family members so that they collapse on the ground or run away screaming, Mama! <laughs> so it turned out a bit sillier than I first envisioned it. But I really like that aspect as a compliment to the darkness and the spookiness of it. So what about the kids that get scared? Yeah, many testers have been excited and a bit nervous about meeting certain characters and entering certain rooms. Why do you think that is? It's, it's like a really imaginative kids. They tend to uh, make up their own story around this um, that could creep them out a bit. But they have always been, been eager to get help from someone so they can play. And they ask a friend or a grown-up to help them like make the ghost boo, if that's uh, the scary part. And I think that it's really a really positive thing to be able to challenge and manage your own fears. Thank you. Before we say goodbye to you, Lolo, do you, you want to introduce the real play expert in the room? Is she here uh, sleeping, maybe? Or is she, <laughs> did she go for a walk? Yeah, she's outside sleeping. Okay, so Willow has a one and a half year old. So I'm noticing a lot of the good design come from parents who design for their children. And so we know that we'll see more good things from Poca Poca. Mm -hmm. So there's your news. <laughs> and now, uh, to show that there is David and Goliath stories, I'd like to introduce you to a featured app maker. Um, your, your first app was called, yes. uh, oh, perfect, on cue. <laughs> the expert, the real play expert. So, uh, so you made Fingal, right? Yes. What was that one? Well, two people each put down uh, one hand on the yeah. other hand. Yeah, they kind of have to intertwine their hands. Oh, that's like, oh, that's crazy. Um, yeah, so the idea was that two people touch each other. Um, and you're not married yet. I am not married oh, yet. Why? Well, how's that happen? So well, because of this. Yeah, maybe. Every time I do this, someone else gets jealous. Um, yeah, so that was definitely a, a, our first thing, and that got attention, and it kind of blew up, and well, that kind of in a good way. Yeah, set me off. Uh, yeah, continuing to do weird stuff like this. So speaking of weird stuff, tell us more about game making and, game. and how you like to do it. So um, the main point of our game is always something social, or at least so far. So for Fingal, we wanted to explore the interaction of touching each other's hands. Um, for all our ga games afterwards, um, for instance, Bamfu, we wanted people to push each other away. Um, for Friends Trap, we wanted people to actually talk to each other and have meaningful, meaningful conversations uh, about really weird, awkward topics. Um, and for our latest game, we wanted people to dance together. Um, so everything is a bit about this interaction thing. Um, and um, I guess what I wanted to do today... Yeah, we're going to try something crazy. Yes, something crazy. Back to the roots, back to what it's all about. We're actually going to play a game together. Well, the expert doesn't want to. But, um, so um, the first game this is just a, a kind of a, a warm-up uh, game, and we'll just wait until uh, the expert allows us to. Um, she hit the home button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, who's next? <laughs> um, so the first game, I'm gonna need all of you to actually help me here. Uh, it's not gonna, you don't have to stand up in this case, uh, but I am going to. Um, I'm going to ask all of you to close your eyes. Is everyone closing his eyes? Yes? Okay. So what we're going to do together, and keep your eyes closed, is we're going to count to 20. But we're going to do it together, all of us. Um, of course we're going to do 1, 2, 3, 4. You can't Everyone here is going to scream their own scream, just yell a number. Uh, they have to be 
in chronological chronological order. Hey, Warren, you're looking. Um, and you can't say a number twice. Or a number, uh, you can't say one, two. You can only say one. So I'm going to say one here. Who's going to say two? Two. Three. Ah, oh, okay, so now we lose, and we have to start over from number one. One. Two. Oh. <laughs> one. Two. Three. Ah. Oh. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Oh. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, you can't do that. Oh, no, that was a rule. You can't do that. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, one. <laughs> there, there it was. Two, three. Oh, one, two, no, one, two, three, four. Oh, one, two. <laughs> what? We can do this. Just join me uh, here in this area. Yes, please come forward. It's gonna be fun. It's more fun to participate than to watch. All right? So just come here. So the game we're gonna be playing is called Brewery. 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 Actually, repeat after me. Pruy. Pruy. Very important. You have to remember this. So the game of Pruy works like this. We're all going to be standing kind of here in this area. So if you could all just come a bit closer here, um, because so we could go a bit more. Yes. Um, so stay away a bit from the edges. Uh, so come closer to me, a bit like this. Yes. All right. Perfect. So the game of Pruy works like this. Again, we're all going to be closing our eyes, um, but not now. I'm just going to explain first. What we're going to do is we, we're going to um, search for the Puri. We can all become part of the Puri in the end. And I'll explain to you how that's done. So normally, when you're not the Puri, you have your eyes closed, you look around, or actually you don't look around. You touch around, looking for someone else's hand. And then you shake the hand, and you say, Puri? And the other person is not the Puri. And he says back, no. No. You say Puri. Puri. Exactly. So like we're not the Puri. Yeah. When you're not the Puri, you say back Puri. Puri? I haven't found Puri yet. And then there's someone who is the Puri. And I shake hand. I say Puri. You say nothing. And now we are both part of the Puri. And we keep holding each other's hands. And then I have one hand left. And then someone else can grab that hand and ask me Puri, and I will say nothing back. And in the end, the Puri's got to be one long string. Hold the Puri. Can you open your eyes? You may not open your eyes until I say so. So, here's actually a little thing. It can... Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to try to keep you all kind of in this little circle in a bit. Um, there's one thing about cheating. Of course, it's going to be a, a bit... You know, sometimes you're going to be like, oh, I really want to know where I am right now. You can peek a little sometimes. <laughs> you can just, like that. 
but it's more fun if you don't because it's going to be this weird. <laughs> well, we're red. Okay. Anyway, um, so I suggest we all close our eyes and we start asking around, start shaking hands. Let's do it. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'll be excited. Try to look for the brewery. I will be assigning a brewery soon, so the brewery will be alive at some point. Okay, there is a brewery. I, I, I hear one. Oh, I see some people are connected now. They are alive. Oh, here's some more. Oh, I there's less furries. Still not a prairie. Maybe you look for where the, the prairie is, and then, and then follow the arms. Oh, look! There it goes. Ooh, one left. I think we found the prairie. You can now open your eyes. Don't let go. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. You can let go. Okay, for those who are up for it, one more little game. This is gonna be this is gonna be a very simple game. Um, we're gonna try to stand in a circle around the table. Can we do that? I'll, I'll, stand, I'll stand here. Um, I think we're gonna need a bit more people. So who didn't play the previous game should definitely come join. It's a very simple game uh, because what we're going to do is the lap game. We are going to sit in each other's laps. <laughs> but we need to be shoulder to shoulder, so we're going to need about four or five more people. Please join us. Perfect. Okay, so we should make the circle a bit smaller. So. Um, be sure to be shoulder to shoulder. Yes. Um, yes, perfect. For, I think it should be just slightly more small. If you guys can come this way a bit more. Yes. Oh, make sure you're actually shoulder to shoulder. Like that. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, so what we're going to do is turn around. We all need to face the same way, guys. We have to sit in each other's laps in the end. Wait, what? Yeah, we're going on. Perfect. Okay, so now I'm going to put down the mic because I actually need to participate. Um, what we're going to do is first do a test run. And it works like this. With your hands, you're going to grab the thigh of the person in front of you. Oh, you Dutch people are just so <laughs> New Jersey, we don't do this in Jersey. Oh. Okay, yes, and very slowly, very slowly, we're gonna move our button. This is where I draw the words. Towards the knees of the other person. Very slowly. Glad my wife. Very slowly. You need to be able to sit. So make sure you sit. Don't sit yet. Don't sit yet. Make sure. Okay, go up. Go up again. There is, there's someone of a hole over there and over there. So make sure you also make, put your knees below the bottom of the person in front of you. 
All right. Okay. Here, yeah, we're going to do a test run. But here we go. We're very slow. Slowly, 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 very slowly. It's just test run. Oh, up, 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 up. up. Oh, I just need to be absolutely sure we can do this. Okay. Okay. Okay, here we go. We're going to try it now. Very slowly, come down. Are we all sitting? Are we all sitting? Yeah. yeah. Actually sit down. Yeah. Let go of your hands. <laughs> Relax a bit. Okay, there, I have no idea how to get out of it. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. This connects to the games I play, right? Yeah, that's a good question. How does this play connect to all the weird stuff I I do in an office behind a computer? Um, well, it's actually very simple. Uh, for me, games are very much about interaction. Interaction to have interaction with each other. So there's actually actionable things that you can see that you can especially see in these kinds of full games, and that's a huge, huge, huge inspiration to me. Where there's those things like closing your eyes and then being super aware of the people around you. Um, there is putting your hands on someone's thigh. That's strange. And there's all these weird... Quite exciting, actually. Yes, exciting as well. And the kind of games I try to make, they try to put technology, sensors, digital stuff in between those interactions. And then I just come up with a weird, silly idea around it. And sometimes it turns out to be really fun. Um, like, like, like dancing together, um, holding a phone, or, um, I don't know, rubbing each other's fingers. Um, so yeah, that's, this kind of folk games are really my, my main inspiration for uh, this play, my main inspiration for, for our games. So, so that. That's beautiful. And the uh, notion of a uh, mediator in the process and the, the the big idea here I think is technology mediated play exactly. or tablet mediated play but how can you use accelerometers <clears throat> how can you use the microphone the cameras exactly. that is now in everyone's pockets exactly to make or enhance or fool around with the concept of that we could have never done before. And, and I think there's a whole new frontier, and we're sitting here with a pioneer in the space, and he's got the apps to show it, at least two. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and so now we're gonna go right into the heart of the maker movement by a pioneer who's been there in the UK. We started by hosting a workshop, um, and we're really standing on the shoulders of things that have been around for a long time. So Warren talked a little bit about um, um, pedagogies and constructivism. Um, my mother is a Montessori teacher. She's run a Montessori school for 37 years. It's not a mistake that I think I am running a business that is very much hands-on. Um, and I think these kind of old, old but really relevant pedagogies around humans learning best by doing and making it's just something that we have all experienced in our careers and our practices, and that's kind of embedded in our products and services. Then there's this other thing, which is the maker movement. So I don't know how many people have been to a maker fair. Has anyone been to a maker fair? So you will see that this maker movement is not a blip. <laughs> um, it's not just this kind of gathering of a few people to talk about the things we're making. The maker fair that it was in San Francisco, um, I think it attracted 400,000 people. The first one that was in Rome um, last year attracted 40,000 people in its first year. So this is this amazing movement of makers and producers and hobbyists that are using technology as a vehicle for being active kind of participants um, in solving problems, having fun, creating all kinds of amazing kind of wonderful things. And so we're really kind of riding on the shoulders of this fantastic um, on and offline movement that's happening in the world at the moment. And then this other thing happened, which we didn't know was gonna happen at all. Um, so the UK um, in September became the first country in the world to require programming as part of its curriculum. So primary and secondary school teachers now have to teach programming as part of the curriculum. 
So part of us was like, great, it's about time. And then the other part is a bunch of teachers that are basically terrified because they don't know how to teach any of this. So a bunch of teachers that are teaching five-year-olds now have to teach them algorithms. <laughs> awesome, but how, how does a teacher that's never done that begin to address these really kind of complex but really exciting kind of philosophies and principles? So these are kind of the foundations for kind of what our business is kind of riding around. So what we developed was a collection of DIY gadget kits. So basically, um, all of our kits help you to make, play, code, and invent your own devices. So we're really not just interested in the computer and the screen as a medium, we're interested as a tool for creating things in the physical world. Um, all of our gadgets, and this I was trying to make some connections between what everyone was talking about. Um, all of our gadgets are designed around everyday life themes because we think people learn more when they care about what they're going to make. And a lot of um, young people in particular, when they're solving problems, when there's agency connected to the stuff they're doing, there's a real excitement about um, solving a problem, finding a solution. So we design our kids around things like gaming and gardening and cycling um, because those are the things that surround us and we think technology should exist in those things as a vehicle for having fun and basically solving things. Um, so our kids range from things like Electrodo. So there's Electrodo in Media Lab, actually. I didn't know that, but Warren told me that. Um, basically, it's conductive Play-Doh. So we teach young people, and quite frankly, a lot of adults, about things like electricity and conductivity. Um, you make your own dough. It doesn't come with dough, which is part of the making process. You use flour, water, salt. Um, and the thing that makes it conductive is basically um, lemon juice and salt. Um, and then you make insulating dough. So we talk about insulation and conductivity. And basically, you play. You make um, prototypes, worlds. You just do lots of different activities, lighting up LEDs, making motors spin, buzzers buzz. I have a three-year-old. Play-Doh is in kind of standard part of our um, experience. And once you start to see lights light up and buzzers spin, or buzzers buzz, it just brings this whole nother level of kind of engagement to the process, which is really fun. <coughs> and it's a really nice tool for teachers and families to bring technology into kind of a play experience that has nothing to do with the screen, but can do if you want it to. Um, so we love the physicality of it. So one of our favorite kits is the Thirsty Plan Kit. You make your own moisture sensor out of plaster and nails. Sometimes it's the first time people have ever seen sensors or even touched a sensor. Um, and then you basically, it's solar powered and it's a twist circuit. And when your plant needs watering, an LED flashes to tell you to water your plants. So a really fun kind of practical way of solving a problem but using physical technology. And then we have add-on kits like the automatic watering can kit where when your sensor tells the plant that it's dry, the, water, the watering can tips to water the plant. So again, bringing the kind of physical world to life using technology is, is what our kits are really about. DIY speaker is increasingly becoming one of my favorite kits. Um, you solder your own amplifier and then you design and construct speakers out of any material. And we host um, eight regular workshops in London in our studio, which are open to the public. We have some family days, we have some um, just for designers, basically around observing and seeing how people are using our kits and developing resources around them. So this speaker is made out of a balloon because in one of our workshops, someone made a speaker out of a balloon and it sounded so great that we now include a balloon in all of the kits. Um, so one of the things we really love about making kits is that we can be really iterative. We can pay attention to what people are doing and we can adjust things and make them better, which is really fun. Um, so another kind of parallel that I was thinking about why everyone else was talking is the process we go through to develop our kits, um, which is basically um, user-centered design. So we have regular workshops where we're gathering insights regularly about how people are making our kits. Um, where are the difficult points? Where do people get confused? Because in the end, you're using real electronics and that can get a little scary for some people. So how can we make these things um, much more engaging and much more um, accessible to more people? Um, so in this particular process, we did actually a research project where we um, workshopped and did surveys with 300 young people in the UK in nine regions to understand what they were making in school already, what kinds of skills around technology they were learning, and most importantly, what did they like doing with their friends? Um, and those themes of that insight became, became the initial process for what we basically then developed um, is a, basically a, a minimum viable kit, so like an MVP. Once we have that MVK, we put it in the hands of young people, we do lots of different workshops to see the interactions with them, 
And then we basically develop resources and put something into market. So none of our kits ever go to market until we've basically gone through quite a lot of um, iterations. In this particular um, research project, what was really interesting is that a lot of kids in the UK are learning skills around technology, but they don't remember what they're learning because they don't care about what they're making. So they'll basically learn things like scripting, but they're making Excel spreadsheets. So they don't really care. They don't even know that they did any kind of programming because they're making an Excel spreadsheet. I like Excel spreadsheets now because I have a business, but when I was nine, I'm pretty sure I didn't really care about that. Um, the other thing we learned was that they really like making things, and they like making things in lots of different parts of their lives. Um, and so the themes that came out of that were quite interesting. So things like games we thought would happen, so we kind of developed something around games. Um, sports was interesting because sports wasn't about playing sports. It was about wellness and performance. A lot of kids were really concerned about things like calories. They didn't understand them. Should they pay attention to them? Um, and they really wanted to be able to perform and understand how they could be healthy, which was a nuance to just sports, which was quite interesting for us. And then friends was interesting because it wasn't just about chatting with friends. It was about deepening relationships and making new friends. So these were the starting places for basically a development process. Um, so we produce minimum viable kits, basically kits that are just good enough to put in the hands of people. They're very raw. Um, we did, in this particular case, we did 40 workshops with a place in the UK called the Royal Institution. It's this beautiful um, space, um, basically where science was kind of um, invented for, in some capacity. They have like hand-blown beakers downstairs. They have this beautiful laboratory. And basically they just brought kids in to their workshop and we did tons and tons of workshops to understand how far we could take kids. Did they like soldering, first of all? Did they like soldering together or individually? How far can we take them as far as programming skills? Basically just really understanding the interactions and the making kind of process and how much did they understand, how engaged were they? So we did a bunch of different workshops with them. Um, the first one, sorry, this one was the gamer, the first version of our gamer. Um, and in the gamer, what you do is you make, play, code, and adventure in games. And I'll show you that kit in a second. The second one is something called the mover, and this was based on sports, and this is a wearable kit, basically like a DIY fuel band or a Fitbit. Basically, it's about little data, so your data, not big data. How do you use that data and qualify it? How do you actually visualize it to make it something useful and fun and visual? So in that workshop, kids were doing push-ups and sit-ups, and for some kids, it was the first time they ever really understood that movement could be visual, that it had an output to it, which is a really exciting um, kind of process. And this was about friends. So this is like the game Cups. You have a cup and a string and a cup. It's wireless cups. Basically, you make wireless networks. You don't know who's in your network, so you play games around finding who's in your network. So really analog ways of communicating, which was, I mean, just a really amazing kind of thing for kids to see that. It's a really old school technology, but for a generation that is so immersed in digital technology, it was kind of like magic which is kind of what we want to see happening in the workshops. Um, so those are all prototypes, but basically what we do is we go from proving a concept, what kind of game or thing do we want to make? Is it screen-based, is it buttons? Then we do a minimum viable kit, so something to put in the hands of young people, and from our experience with kits, a lot of kits stop there. It's, you know, it's raw, it's just kind of exposed, maybe slightly um, intimidating for a lot of young people, let alone parents. Um, so what we try and do is actually design something which we think is iconic. We want our gadgets to be iconic gadgets that live in the world of Apple and Samsung and all these homogenous gadgets, but feel nothing like those gadgets because you made them. So um, based on that research, we launched our gamer last year at the Wired conference in the UK next to PlayStation 4, which was pretty funny. So there's us with our 8x8 screen, cardboard boxes with resistors and capacitors, and then they're like giant screens. Um, but the nice thing was that we like stood our own. There's space for both. There's space for super immersive, very complex gaming. And then there's this excitement about, you have an 8 bit screen, what are you gonna do with it? Um, and that was what was really exciting about kind of the gamer in particular. So basically the gamer, you solder your own amp, you solder the whole game console together. You play two games, it comes with Pong and Snake, which were programmed by a 15 year old that did a work placement with us. So we have regular work placements with 15 year olds. 15 because they're going into the next stage of school in the UK, and also because there's nothing like a 15-year-old telling you something's really stupid to kind of um, help you understand your, your process. So you play two games, Pong and Snake, that come with it, and then you basically learn step-by-step -step animations and then programming your own games. So we've had everything from I'm Sorry, Happy Birds, 
um, to Tetris, to exploding Tetris, all different kinds of games. And the thing that's always exciting to us is that when you have boundaries, you focus on game mechanics. So what's your character? What's your challenges? What's your scoring system? And that's where the real kind of um, inventiveness comes. Um, so this was um, our most expensive kit and also our best selling kit. And that really helped us to understand that it wasn't just about cheap, it's actually about relevance and depth of experience. So um, we have online spaces where all the programming happens. We're building um, a web app at the moment, which will basically be a solidified kind of experience to kind of create this digital physical ecosystem. Um, and also what we get a lot is people want to share what they're making and we want to have a much more robust place for that to happen. What teachers are doing with our kids, what parents are doing with our kids is way more interesting than anything we could do. So we want to make sure that that's being kind of spread in as many ways as possible. Um, we now sell education boxes. Um, we have a lot of teachers buying our kids and we were not really doing anything to help them. So at the beginning of this year, we basically launched boxes, which are packs of 12 to 16 kids in a box with all the resources. Um, a teacher, makerspace, library, facilitator, code club needs to use our kids as part of a facilitated experience. Um, and most importantly for us and what we're learning as we go is that it's not actually even about the skills, it's about the process of getting to the skill. Um, most developers or most people that work in technology will, I think, agree that the, the skill itself is great because it helps you to visualize and imagine the possibility, but actually the problem solving, the critical thinking, the debugging, is what's really, really important, because those are the skills that actually take us farther. Um, the programming languages young people will have in the next 10 years are not the ones that we have now, and we think these critical thinking skills is actually really important for the next generation. Um, content is really important, so we have a lot of different content, and although we do have instruction, that's very much a part of the process, we have many different kinds of instruction because we want to really help diverse learners learn. So we do have manuals, but we also have videos, we have project sheets, we have all different kinds of ways to essentially go through that making journey. Um, and then, I always like ending with this because, um, well one, because I think our kids exist in a bit of a future scenario of gadgets. Um, one of the impetuses for designing kids that are iconic is that we think that the world might be a little bit less sci-fi, robots take over the world, and a little bit more, um, my gadget does what I want it to because I actually have the skills to make it do that. And we think that might be a world that's a little bit more meaningful and a little bit maybe messier, but actually a really satisfying place to be. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what we do. In a Thank nutshell. you. Stephanie, I want to ask the obvious question. How did you get the name of your company? Um, so a little bit of trial and error. So if anyone has kids, you read a list, you test it out. So we tested it out, and um, we tested out some names that just made me really unhappy. Um, that I just didn't like how they felt. And then when we came to this one, I got the most um, kind of angry email from one of our um, kind of advisors. And it was a great email because he didn't agree. He was like, technology's not gonna save us. This is not what's gonna happen. And the thing that we really wanted with the name was for it to provoke a conversation. So even the name is a maker. Or because we don't think it's gonna save us. We think we are gonna save us. But uh -huh. we think if you know more about it, you will actually be able to use it in more productive ways. Adrian? I agree with that. No, you, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. I never get involved. With a, with a in a thing with a Dutch person, <laughs> learn. Do not bother. Uh, did you have a question or uh, no, no? No. Okay, I just I was picking up. Good. Um, six decades ago, there was a small company a startup in my town in Michigan uh, that called Heathkit, and they made soldering kits. You say soldering. Yeah, it does not, have an L. Yeah, right? I, I don't know. But um, one, a young boy in California purchased one. It was You could make your own radios, metal detectors. My brothers made it. Uh, my brother grew up to be an engineer at Whirlpool. The boy in California was Steve Jobs. Yeah. And so these ideas can turn into very powerful things. A lot of innovation started as kits. The steam engine started as a kit. Apple computers started as kits. Kits are great ways to prototype, test, figure stuff out. And I think 
One thing we're very aware of is that, you know, we didn't invent electronic kits, but what I think we're doing is reframing them and making them relevant for a generation that has a very different kind of technology and kind of interruptions happening in their lives. We hope that in the future we will be, you know, that, that kit that I made when I was younger helped me to do this when I get older. And it's, it, it takes time for us to see the impact of the work we're doing, but it's not just about product, it's about later impact. So that's a huge part of what we're trying to develop at the moment. It's interesting how all of us are more or less facilitating the outside world rather than trying to create a whole new world. I, I, th I thought that was an interesting observation. Uh, where, yeah, I mean, just basically what you just said, but that counts for, for you and mm -hmm. for me as well. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, your favorite programming app or experience? Uh, I have mine. I'm just curious to know what you guys have in terms of getting kids coding. Any, con any ideas? I mean, one of the things that, so we do lots of workshops with kids. Um, we have lots of teachers using our kits, and we also see lots of um, teachers using other kinds of tools as well. One of the things that I think is, it's not a favorite, it's more just an observation about the tools out there. I think there's a really big step from doing block-based programming to programming. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of teachers and a lot of people that are saying, oh, my, my son's done Scratch, or my daughter's done Scratch, or I've done Scratch, and now they can program. And, I, and then there's a lot of initiatives, like the Hour of Code, and there's, which are amazing in raising awareness, but I think there's a difference between awareness and learning, like depth versus just a little bit of understanding. Um, and I think there, I hope that as more organizations like us and more organizations that are, and, and quite frankly, more schools teach these skills, that people will begin to see that disconnect between just understanding a little bit and then actually being able to use it as a tool to do something. Um, with it. And so we have this conversation internally a lot about abstraction and how much we want to abstract things. Um, and it's really important to us that we abstract it only enough to lower the barrier of entry, not so much so that you're not actually having to make mistakes and figure stuff out. That's a decision we've made. Yep, and I think uh, another, a lot of people forget about developmentally appropriate programming and coding that to really understand coding and get the essence, you need to understand how variables work, which cognitively doesn't happen. As Piaget would say, formal operational would be 10, age 10, 11, 12. And if you try to force or you know expect a child to understand how variables work, even if it's with scratch, it just won't work. So they need to do things like more concrete building in the early years where they can, and I'm, I've seen some apps like Tinker and um, Hopscotch and yeah. uh, some other apps, and I do, I love Scratch, but I, So do we, I mean we love it, it's not about not loving it, it's more about the the misinterpretation of what, exactly. it's, what it's done, yeah. I think uh, it's, it's this power that we have, to quote Willow, um, we are empowering children, it can be very powerful, it can also be misused if you don't use it correctly, it can scorch the earth of learning if you push kids too much and they will hit the home button. I want to ask you for your ideas of hot and cool and just open it wide uh, to you. Um, we know you can count to 17. So <laughs> um, ask, a, 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 ask any question. Well, I'll make a remark. Yeah, please. It's very nice, uh, the, the jury of the new media this media production this year, the, their main um, finding was basically that, that we are changing from gaming into playing and from working according to rules into making your own rules, being part of the play. And I feel, I didn't really deliberately put you for that reason together, but it's really nice to see that it's exactly what you are saying. And in that sense, when you add this towards that we're moving away from the screen a little bit, and that's what you see in the media lab as well, there are more and more objects-based uh, well, interactions instead of screens and computer mouses or joysticks. So I think you already nailed it very nicely, for me at least. Uh, it's always nice so to hear we nailed it by Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> Pauline has put together the whole media lab and, and really understands at a very core level the power of play and, and learning.
learning. And that is the engine that's driving it. It's the engine that drove, drives Tokoboka. And if you, you, if you do it right, you, you grab it, you, you can package it in an app. There can be great benefit, not just financially, but in, in the power. These are, these apps are the Beatles. They are the Wizard of Oz. They are the, um, the, uh, the J.K. Rowling's of the, what children will remember. So children only get so much childhood. These are the, the events that they'll remember, and it's very powerful stuff. And so I congratulate all of you for the, the work that you're doing, and Pauline for put, bringing leaders together that we can have this conversation. It's always a delightful opportunity. So we, I, I turn it back over to you. I know that we've got some events and things related. There's a conference tomorrow all about app design. And it's always been a very rich place in terms of knowledge and picking up, bringing leaders together here at CNA Kid. Um, is there anything else we need to know or that I should say at the end? Um, well, there's one more day. <laughs> there is one more day. And the results of the competition will be announced. Tonight at 8 is the award ceremony. The big surprise. And we can't say who it is. No. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>